in writing um, The Side of Brightness, I had to deal with a lot. I had to deal with a certain amount of guilt that I would go and um, be with these homeless people in the tunnels. I dealt with the guilt in some way in just trying to be as honest as possible with the material. Also, I, I helped out whenever I could. I would try to bring down food and candles and, and help out in any way, help out just by listening. When I got paid for the novel, I tithed a percentage of the money to the guys who helped me out and everything like that. A couple of years ago, there would be a couple of thousand people living in the tunnels. A lot of that has changed since they got a new mayor in New York who uh, locked all the gates, closed off all the tunnels, and went through and knocked down all the shacks and shanties. So that now, even for me and for these homeless people, it's virtually impossible to get down into the tunnels. A lot of the guys who live in this particular tunnel will come along in the evening, and then they'll just stand at the end of the platform to make sure that there's no cops around or nobody around looking for them, and then they'll just disappear into the garden. I thank you all the one for me. Here is where we ought to be. There are all sorts of people who live down in the tunnels. I met people who had been prostitutes, crack dealers, people who'd been on television, women who had children and just got addicted to drugs and had gone down. Most of them having in common a thing of shame between them. And so it's a metaphor. The city itself is a symbol. And then the tunnels themselves are a symbol of that city. The tunnels being the unconscious or subconscious mind of the city, where all the dark things go. He descends the embankment that leads to the gate. Some flowers are in bloom by the crabapple trees. His feet slide in the muck. The gate is locked. Clarence Nathan gazes at the ironwork and at a bar that is bent backward. He waits for a long time for his heart to quiet itself. Then he bends his body and nudges his way through the gap. He stands for a long time on the metal platform, like he and his grandfather had once done. All is quiet. The tunnel is high and wide and gracious. Goosebumps on his skin when he descends the steps. He moves into the shadowy depths across a heap of garbage. He opens a bottle and sips from it and looks up at the ceiling. He gazes along the tunnel, and then he feels it. It rises through him. It is primitive and necessary. And he knows now that he belongs here, that this is his place. So common sense tell me, get the fuck out! In writing about the characters in the book is really interesting because um, I spent nine months writing the, the book from a sort of Irish point of view. It was actually an older Irish man who used to go down to the tunnels and meet all these homeless people and so on. And I spent, I wrote about 150 pages, nine months of work, solid work, about this man who went down to the tunnel. And then I, I looked at it one day and I had met the characters of Tree Frog, Papa Love, Dean. I'd met all these characters on the ground. I'd met Nathan Walker, who's a tunnel digger. In my imagination, I had met them. And so I took those pages and I literally dumped them in the bin and I never looked at them again because I, basically what I was doing was wrongly writing about myself. A lot of people thought that I wouldn't be able to sort of say acquire a, a black voice or whatever it happened to be. I used to take down a, um, a tape recorder with me and I'd tape record these guys talking, and um, I'd come home and play the tape recorder out to myself, write down the words, and then try and get into the voice, and try and get into the rhythm of the voice. And um, so I worked on, on, on acquiring a sort of, a different accent, a different access. And then when I was finished, I took it to um, a very well-known American actor who's on Broadway in Driving Miss Daisy. His name's Arthur French, an African-American actor. And I asked him to read the book for me. And he says, yeah, 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 I'll read the book, no problem. Uh, but I said to him, no, will you read the book to me? And so he read from 
the very beginning of the book to the end of the book, if you read it and for intonation and uh, phrases and you know where a phrase was wrong, he would tell me, well, you can't say my mother whipped me, you have to say my mama whooped me or something like that, you know, just, uh, he helped me to get the vernacular uh, right. Because if you're Irish and you go into America, you better get it right, just like an American. If you were an American writer going into Ireland and writing an Irish novel, you better get it right, because everyone's going to be examining you very, very closely to see if you have the big arras and big jays, you know, the things that we hate, things that we detest in writing, those cliches, those, those easy, those easy words and everything like that. So I didn't want that to happen to me in writing, say, an American book. So that's why I, I had a lot of outside uh, collaboration before it was finished to make sure that it was right or close to right, or as close to right as I could get it. Curiously enough, the easiest thing for me to write in the book was Tree Frog's confession of what his shame was in his life where he sits on a beach in Coney Island with this woman, Angela, and he tells her what it is he did in his life that forced him down into the tunnels. For some reason, when I wrote that, I just wrote it in, in a matter of days. But I'd lived with it for, for, for about two years, waiting for the point where I was, I was going to have to confront Tree Frog's shame. I had a wife and child, he says. I never hit them. Sure, sure, sure. She left me. Sure she did. They both left me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't got my sympathy. And for a moment, he's back in the playground near 97th Street. And it's four years ago, and he's with his daughter, and she's on the cusp of puberty. It's a summer's day, and he's guiding her on the swing. She's too old for swings, and her legs are too long, so she tucks them underneath the small wooden platform, but kicks them out when she rises high. He must push with both hands. And she shouts with joy. This is the moment she loves the most. But she will not love it for very much longer. He pushes her in the high center of her back. But one hand slips and she's in a tight t-shirt. She's been growing taller in recent months. There's not much money for clothes. He's lost his job. He's lost control of his hands. He's pushing her at the armpits now. And still she is moving with joy on the swing. And his fingers, by mistake, touch the soft swell of flesh. Just one hand, and his head is thumping, and he must equalize the pressure, and his fingers stretched out and gently touch the other side of her body, and there's a shoot of something like electricity to him. And he is trembling, but it feels so soft, so lovely, it eases him for a second. All the time he's pushing her, and she doesn't even notice. His hands are at her armpits, and he wishes he could lift his history out of her, his daughter. He is touching her, and he will touch her again, and he will be found out, and he will come down to the tunnel where he will try to murder his hands in shame. The one thing I really wanted to try to avoid when I was writing this book was sentimentalizing these characters as if there were these, um, these fabulous underground people who knew something about the human spirit and were able to get away or whatever that sort of stuff is. I didn't want them to be like that. And also I didn't want to brutalize them because there's these myths about these people who live underground that they eat rats and that they get, you know, they're all violent and things. Uh, I wanted to, to, to go into a, a more, a middle ground and, and, and try and talk about a, um, a deeper truth about these people who lived underground. So that was very important to me to try and avoid the sentimental. I'm quite comfortable um, in saying that I wrote this novel about um, homelessness and people who are in an underclass, while at the same time I built myself a home and was in a, a sort of different uh, economic structure and so on. I came to terms with that. At times I got real guilty, but I felt real guilty about that. But for me, it was a case of telling the story, telling it as well as I, as I possibly could, and, and saying, well, listen, I've done everything that I could. I could do no more. I've gone as far as I could, and therefore, I'm okay.